Improving and refining the performance of Neuraxo blocks is something I'm deeply interested in, particularly as lumbar Neuraxo blocks remain a core and essential skill for all anesthesiologists, whether you are a regional anesthesia enthusiast or not. In this talk, I'm going to focus on spinal anesthesia as that is what I'm most familiar with, but many of the principles apply to lumbar epidurals as well. While there's evidence that spinal anesthesia may not always be superior to a well-conducted general anesthetic, most notably in hip fracture, it does appear to offer advantages in our older patient populations undergoing elective lower limb surgery, impacting outcomes related to major morbidity. However, this older patient population also presents lots of challenges for us, mainly related to degenerative spinal disease with narrowed spaces, scoliotic deformities, and an increasing incidence of spinal surgery not to mention the epidemic of obesity that continues to afflict many countries. I think that no one would dispute that the use of pre-procedural ultrasound imaging is a cornerstone of managing technically challenging neuraxo blocks. It helps to delineate poorly palpable landmarks and it helps to clarify the alterations in underlying bony anatomy, be it from scoliosis or from previous surgery. It helps us to assess which interlaminar spaces are patent and where they're located, allowing us to more accurately target them. I've previously discussed how to employ ultrasound imaging in different challenging scenarios, and these are freely available, so I won't go into too much detail here. I want, however, to highlight one aspect of my practice related to ultrasound spine imaging and spinal anesthesia that has recently changed, and which has pushed my confidence for success to new levels. Back in 1940, John Taylor described a paramedian approach to the L5-S1 space using the posterior superior iliac spines as a landmark. He proposed a paramedian approach because he felt that the L5 spinous process impeded the midline approach. However, this is not strictly true, as I have found that it is often possible to access the L5 S1 space in the midline. What is true, and has since become well recognized, is that the L5 S1 space is the widest interlaminar space, particularly when the patient's spine cannot be flexed. It also tends to be the best preserved in arthritic and other degenerative spine disease. These images from a healthy young man illustrate this. The L5-S1 space is the widest of all the spaces in the transverse plane, and as a result, you can also see why paramedian or paraspinous access is likely to be maintained and successful in a majority of patients. Now, I was never taught the classical landmark-guided Taylor approach, which requires identification of the posterior superior iliac spine by palpation. I suspect in our modern patient population, accurately identifying this landmark is going to be challenging. The good news is that with ultrasound, we can always quite easily identify the sacrum and the L5-S1 space, and also assess its patency. In my experience, it is indeed the space that remains the most open and accessible in patients with otherwise closed spines. However, the main issue with targeting the L5-S1 space, in my experience, is achieving sufficient block height for surgery of the L1 territory and higher. In Taylor's paper, he actually cites this restricted height of the block as an advantage in terms of greater hemodynamic stability. Now, if you use a hyperbaric solution at L5-S1, injection is occurring inferior to the apex of the lumbar lordosis with a risk of predominantly sacral root anesthesia. If you use plain isobaric solutions as we do, there's a pretty even chance that you won't get a high enough block for hip surgery with conventional doses. An insufficient block height is a common cause of secondary spinal anesthetic failure. This has actually been proven in a dose finding study from 2020, which found that to achieve a T10 block within 25 minutes, the 90% minimum effective dose of 0.5% bupivacaine was 25 milligrams or 5 milliliters of local anesthetic. All of the doses under 17 milligrams failed. The duration of block with these large doses was not reported, but I think we would all agree that it would be unacceptably and excessively prolonged for many of our modern surgical scenarios. The game changer for me has been learning how to make and use hyperbaric local anesthetic solutions. It's well recognized, but perhaps not widely known, that although the specific gravity of most plain local anesthetic solutions is less than that of CSF, the difference is not clinically meaningful. We cannot pre predictably influence the distribution of intrathecal local anesthetic with positional changes, and thus the height of the spinal anesthetic is unpredictable. 
Now, this is not a new concept. The chief advantage of the hyperbaric solution for me has been the fact that even if I inject the local anesthetic at the L5S1 level, I can get the block height that I need for hip and abdominal coverage by placing the patient in the reverse Trendelenburg or head-up position. Even more important, we can get the height we need without resorting to the large doses that would prolong the block unnecessarily. We can also achieve a unilateral block by positioning the patient in lateral decubitus with the operative site uppermost. And this is extremely useful in hip arthroplasty, be it elective hip replacement or hip fracture surgery, as this will be the same position that the surgeons will use. And so the surgeons can secure the patient, prep and drape while the block takes effect, which contributes to operating room efficiency. Finally, another advantage of this selective block is less vasodilatation and greater hemodynamic stability, as shown in a recent randomized control trial that compared this technique with general anesthetics. Hypobaric local anesthetic solutions can be made by diluting plain isobaric local anesthetic with sterile water. Saline will not achieve the same effect due to its sodium chloride content. This has been demonstrated in multiple studies that have used hypobaric local anesthetic mixtures. There are many different recipes out there, but these are the two that I currently use in my practice. For most total hip and knee surgeries, I mix 2 ml of 0.5% bupivacaine with 1 ml of water to create 3 ml of a 0.33% concentration. Injecting all 3 ml provides for a surgical block duration above L1 for about 2 hours, with patients being able to ambulate within 4 hours of the spinal. You can choose to add opioid, fentanyl for increased clinical duration and quality of surgical anesthesia, or morphine for prolonged prosoperative analgesia. If you want a longer duration spinal, just use more bupivacaine. For example, 3 ml of 0.5% bupivacaine combined with 1 to 1.5 ml of water. The second recipe I commonly use is diluting 3 ml of 2% mepivacaine or lidocaine with 1 ml of water to create a 1.5% concentration. A potential added benefit of this dilution is that it may reduce the risk of TNS or transient neurological symptoms. I find that injecting 50 mg of mepivacaine or approximately 3.4 ml reliably provides just under 2 hours of operating time for lower limb surgery. 3 ml or 45 mg of lidocaine is currently my preference for short day surgery cases that last approximately 1 hour or less, like knee arthroscopy. We've observed that lidocaine has a faster and more abrupt offset than mepivacaine, which can be an advantage in the appropriate scenarios. The last strategy I want to offer you is again not something novel, but rather something I think that deserves more attention, and that is the paramedian approach, or what I prefer to call the paraspinous approach. I realize that I risk adding to confusion by calling it a paraspinous approach, but I feel strongly about this because the term paraspinous instead of paramedian emphasizes a critical principle that simplifies the technique and increases success, which is that the needle must be inserted close to the midline, i.e. the spinous process, at a small lateral to medial angle. The paramedian approach is often taught as needle insertion in a lateral to medial direction that starts at a skin insertion site up to 2 centimeters or a finger breadth away from the midline. However, it then becomes challenging to accurately triangulate the needle trajectory to enter the interlaminar space, as the appropriate angle will vary with both this distance and the depth of the space. The practitioner is thus faced with a wide range of potential lateral to medial angles to choose from during the initial insertion and the subsequent redirections. And redirection is further complicated by the choice of appropriate cranial angulation. Note that in inappropriate lateral to medial angle will potentially contact the bony surface of not just the lamina, but also the spinous process, i.e. to medial, or the articular processes, to lateral. And my observation from years of supervising trainees is that distinguishing between these bony structures based on tactile feedback can be challenging for novices. And so their redirections become haphazard instead of being logical and systematic. Since the entire premise of the approach is merely to avoid the midline interspinous space, the needle only needs to be inserted immediately lateral to the spinous process. And by starting much closer to the midline, not more than one centimeter, the lateral to medial angle can be kept smaller, allowing the needle to slide in alongside the spinous process, hence the term paraspinous. In this trajectory, 
depending on the transverse plane of the skin insertion site relative to the interlaminar space, the needle tip will either pass directly from the paraspinous muscle into the ligamentum flavum, which is a transition that will be clearly signaled by the characteristic change in tactile feedback. Or it will contact a bony surface, which at this angle will inevitably be the vertebral lamina. And in the latter instance, incremental cranial angulation will walk the needle tip off the superior edge of the lamina and into the ligamentum flavum, which again will be clearly signaled by its feel and the ability to advance the needle deeper. I've described the fundamental principles and execution of this technique in detail in a video that you can access online, so I won't delve into details here. I will say that like all skills, it does take a little bit of practice to master, which is mostly related to building the appropriate mental model in your head, but I can guarantee you that it is worth the effort. I do want to mention a few points related to the paraspinous technique though. First, there are patient-centered benefits that have been demonstrated in several randomized controlled trials. These include a lower incidence of back pain, which could be explained by the fact that needle damage to supraspinous and interspinous ligaments may take longer to heal than needle trauma to the paraspinal muscles. There is low, also a lower incidence of posterior puncture headache. It's postulated to be due to the oblique path of a paraspinous approach that creates a flat valve mechanism from overlapping perforations of the different layers of the flavum and dura. Mastering the paraspinous approach also pays off because it's often successful in situations where the midline approach is difficult due to narrowed interspinous spaces from disease or just suboptimal positioning. As we've discussed, the paramedian interlaminar window also generally has larger dimensions than the midline window and thus is an easier target to hit. The paraspinous approach can be used in obese patients in conjunction with ultrasound imaging to find the midline and the location of interlaminar spaces. In fact, it's become my preferred approach because it requires much less precision than trying to advance in the midline. In obese patients, there's a tendency for the needle to deflect and deviate from the intended straight line trajectory, particularly if the needle is not handled in advance with the appropriate attention to detail. If you try to go midline and are even slightly off the midline, this often ends up with missing the space, especially if it's narrowed in older patients. I therefore find it much easier to be deliberately paraspinous and aim to strike the bony lamina on that side. Because then I know where I am and where I have to go. I just have to keep walking my needle cranially until it slips into the interlaminar space. This simplifies my decision making for my next steps. The paraspinous approach is also clearly the approach of choice in the presence of scoliosis. Once again, though, it should be combined with the use of pre-procedural ultrasound imaging to identify the direction of spinal rotation and the side that has the widest open spaces. The paraspinous interlaminar spaces are widened on the convex side of the curve and narrowed on the concave side, and the needle should always be inserted on the convex side. There's always a degree of associated rotation, which means that little to no lateral to medial angulation may be needed for entry into the vertebral canal. Again, I refer you to my videos on the subject, which explore these in more detail. I'll end with a comment on real-time ultrasound-guided spinal anesthesia. This has been described with a variety of different approaches, nicely illustrated in this article. I will say that I've used it myself on a few occasions. However, note that this randomized control trial that compared pre-procedural ultrasound imaging and real-time ultrasound-guided spinal anesthesia both using a paraspinous approach, found that the real-time ultrasound-guided technique was significantly more difficult, resulting in more needle insertion attempts, lower first-pass success rates, and longer block performance time. And this was in the hands of three experienced anesthesiologists. This mirrors my own experience. My opinion is that it's only potentially useful when you have a patient with really small spaces that can only be accessed with great precision in advancing the needle. However, at the same time, imaging in these patients is also very challenging and being able to keep this small interlaminar target in view, as well as to localize your needle tip and drive it into the space, requires very advanced skills with spinal imaging and probe and needle handling. 
studies that support real-time ultrasound guided neuraxial blocks, including this one, are all generally in Asian patient populations, where the spectrum of body habitus is perhaps more favorable to the technique. I personally find it very challenging and thus do not routinely perform it. My recommendation will be to master pre-procedural scanning and skin marking, and then to focus on needle handling and tactile feedback from your needle. Finally, we return to one of the most fundamental principles for success, which is to make sure that you handle your needle well. The key is simply to pay attention. Make sure that your redirections are small, controlled, and incremental, and that the needle goes where you intend it to do, that the needle doesn't bend, and that it travels in a straight line without deviating. So in summary, these are the strategies for success in difficult central neuraxial blockade. Develop good needle handling technique. Learn and master pre-procedural ultrasound imaging. When spaces are narrowed, look for and consider targeting the L5-S1 space, but use a hyperbaric local anesthetic mixture to ensure that you get sufficient block height and thus surgical anesthetic success. Finally, master the paraspinous approach as that is often the most feasible one in truly difficult and challenging spines.